Hey, Cass, thanks for dropping me off. I'll see you tomorrow. That was a good Bible study. I want to ask you all a question. Those of you that read the Bible and are concerned about our world, and you're looking at the events on television and the newspaper, and you're wondering where in the Bible does it explicitly tell us exactly what is happening and when these events will occur. Well, let me tell you something. I found it. And it's in a place that most people have never looked. And it's in a story that most people, including all Christians that I know, have never looked before. It's found in the Catholic Bible. There's two chapters in the Bible it's called the books of Maccabee that explain a story that happened 150 years before Jesus was born. And that story is exactly parallel to the events that are happening in today's news. It's the story of Hanukkah. So everybody sit back now and let me tell you a story that's going to blow you away. You're going to see exactly what's happening in America, what's happening in Israel, and what will happen in your lives. So sit back and enjoy. This is the prophetic story of Hanukkah. So as Christians, what can we learn from Hanukkah? First, we need to understand that the central objects relating to Hanukkah are the menorah and the temple. The Feast of Dedication or Hanukkah is celebrated on the 25th day of the Hebrew month of Kislev, which corresponds roughly to early to mid-December on our calendar. It is a commemoration of the rededication of the altar and the temple in Jerusalem. Let's take a look at this diagram of Solomon's temple. On the far right, you'll see an altar. The altar is called the Brazen Altar. This is where the daily sacrifices from the people were brought and burned and offered up to God. The Sea of Bronze was a laver filled with water. And that water was to purify the priests so they can daily enter the holy place, which is the largest section of Solomon's temple. No priest except the high priest was allowed in the most holy place, which occurred once a year. Let's take another look at a diagram. This is the tabernacle that was set up as the Jews wandered in the desert for 40 years. This is after Moses received the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments were stored in the Ark of the Covenant. The bottom left-hand corner is the eight-candle menorah, which burnt daily. And then you'll see above that the table of incense, where the priests would go in and burn incense inside every single day to the Lord. The top left-hand corner shows us the Ark of the Covenant. Now, once a year, the high priest, and only the high priest, could enter the Ark of Covenant and make a sacrifice for the atonement of the sins of the people. And then over on the far right is the table of showbread. This is another picture of Solomon's temple. Again, the brazen altar, the labor of the molten sea. This is again where the mikvah was located, where the priests took their ritual bath. Now, inside the holy place, the walls were laid over with cedar and pure gold. And then you can see inside the holy of holies. There's another diagram showing you all of the increments that are found inside Solomon's Now the original tabernacle of God was movable. This is after Moses uh, received the Ten Commandments and the Ark of Covenants inside. Now finally, uh, God told David to buy this land on top of Mount Moriah and he bought it and they built the first temple. This is Solomon's temple, David's son. All overlaid, everything inside with gold. The facade in the front was 200 feet high. They give you an idea. This is what it looked like inside the temple. There's the holy place, and to the right is the holy of holies. There's the high place. There's two angel cherubims, and there's the altar of incense, and in back again is the, uh, the holy of holies. The temple was destroyed in 586 B.C., and the ark was not found again. It has been said that the menorah is the symbol of the nation Israel, and our mission is to be a light unto the nations. I, the Lord, have called you into righteousness, and I will hold your hand, and I will keep you and give you as a covenant to the people, as a light to the Gentiles. Isaiah 42, 6. The seven candle menorah. According to the Bible, the first menorah was made of a single piece of gold and created to hold seven candles, presented for the use in the first temple in Jerusalem. The temple's menorah and its lighted candles represent several things, including 
the flame of God from the burning bush, the seven days of creation, the spreading the light of Judaism throughout the world, and a symbol of the Jewish state of Israel. And let me also state that the Star of David is not the symbol of Israel. It's only 300 years old. The symbol of Israel is the menorah. Hi, I'm Ron Canner with Maoz Media. We know from scripture that Yeshua took the biblical feast very seriously. In fact, the only time he left the Galilee was to come down to Jerusalem to celebrate them. This was something that he learned not only from reading scripture, but from the example of his parents. Here's some examples. Every year, Luke says, Yeshua's parents went to Jerusalem for the feast of Passover. And in John 7:14, we read, now about the middle of the feast, speaking about the Feast of Tabernacles, Yeshua went into the temple and taught. Now what you may not know is that he also came to Jerusalem to celebrate another feast, one that is not even mentioned in the Torah. Let's read in John chapter 10 verse 22 and 23. Then came the festival of dedication at Jerusalem. It was winter and Yeshua was in the temple courts walking in Solomon's colonnade. The word dedication or consecration in Hebrew is a word that you might already know, Hanukkah. Now why isn't it mentioned in the Bible? Because Hanukkah commemorates something that happened in between the writing of the Hebrew scriptures, the Old Covenant, and the New Covenant. And that was the unlikely victory of the Jewish people in the year 165 BCE against the Syrian emperor Antiochus Epiphanes, who sacrificed a pig in the holy temple desecrating it and demanded that all the Jews worship his Greek gods. Hanukkah is an eight-day feast where we celebrate the rededication of the temple and the miracle of the oil. The Ner Tamid, the eternal lamp, was commanded in scripture to always be lit. You shall charge the sons of Israel that they bring you clear oil of beaten olives for the light to make a lamp burn continually. According to Jewish tradition, they only had enough oil for one day, but miraculously that oil lasted eight days until more oil could be secured. Hanukkah begins on the 25th of the winter month of Kislev, and there's some interesting parallels between the life of Yeshua and this holiday. On the Hanukkah or menorah, the nine branch candelabra upon which we light the Hanukkah candles, the Shamash candle comes down from above in order to light each of the other candles. In the same way, Yeshua came out of heaven to earth. He became as a man, a servant, in order to give us the light of life. And now that we have his light, just like the Ner Tamid that burned continually in the temple, we are to burn for Yeshua. For now, we are his temple. We are to be light in a dark world. As he exhorted, you are the light of the world. A city built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. This Hanukkah, let your light shine and go out of your way to be a blessing to others. From all of us here at Maoz Israel, we want to wish you a Chag Hanukkah Sameach. Happy Hanukkah. Part 2. The Dual History of Hanukkah Revealed. Take a look at the diagram. Most Christians study the book of Daniel. And in the book of Daniel, Daniel had a vision. And in the vision he saw a statue. And the statue represents, and as you can see, the head of gold was the Babylonian Empire. Then the chest and arms represent the Medan Persian Empire. And then the later Grecian Empire, the belly and the thighs of bronze, Turkey, Greece, uh, Syria, and Egypt. And then at the bottom, for the newer times, this is where we are today, the end of times. That's when the final Roman Empire will come into being with the toes and the feet of iron and clay. But for this study, we're going to go to another book. A book that's found in the Catholic Bible. This is the history of what happened in Hanukkah. 1 Maccabees 1. Alexander the Great 
He lived from 356 B.C. to 323 B.C. Alexander, the son of Philip of the Macedonians, came from the land of Greece. He had just defeated Darius, the king of the Persians and the Medes, at the age of 21, succeeded him as king. Alexander fought many battles, conquering strongholds, and put to death the kings of the earth, and he advanced to the ends of the earth and plundered many nations. When the earth became quiet before him, he was exalted, and his heart was lifted up. He gathered a strong army and ruled over countries, nations, and princes, and they became servants to him. Now take a look at this map. The orange is the entire empire of Alexander the Great. During his 12 years as king, commander, politician, and explorer of the Macedonian Greek Empire, Alexander led his army 11,000 miles, founding over 70 cities, creating an empire that stretched across three continents and covered over 2 million square miles. At the age of 33, Alexander fell gravely ill and perceived that he was dying. So he summons his four of his most trusted officers who had been with him since his youth, and he divided his kingdom amongst them while he was still alive. And after Alexander had reigned 12 years, he died. Then his four chief officers divided up Alexander's kingdom and began to rule, each in his own place. And they all put on crowns after his death, and so did their sons after them for many years, and they caused many evils on earth. Chapter 1, verse 10. From them came forth a sinful root, Antiochus' four epiphanies, the son of Antiochus III, the Seleucus king. He began to reign in the 137th year of the kingdom of Seleucus. This is the land that Antiochus Epiphany ruled in green. Now in those days lawless men came forth from Israel and misled many, saying, Let us go and make a covenant with the Gentiles round about us. For since we have separated ourselves from them, many evils have come upon us. 12 and 13. This proposal was widely accepted amongst the Jews. Out of fear from further persecution, they pledged the disciplined king to abandon their holy covenant with God of their fathers and observe instead the ordinances of the Gentiles. So the Jews built a gymnasium in Jerusalem according to the Gentile Greek custom and ended the required practice of circumcision, abolished the Sabbath, and abandoned the holy covenant. So this is what you're taking a look at. This was built in Jerusalem, the holy city. And the Jews abandoned the covenant with God, and they adopted the customs of the Hellenistic people around them. Hellenism is the culture of the Greeks, and the Jews bought into this culture. Verse 15, 1 Maccabees 1, They joined with the Gentiles, and they practiced evil in the sight of God. 15, they joined with the Gentiles and they practiced evil in the sight of God. It's an issue which divides the United States. Should same-sex couples have the same right to marry that heterosexual couples do? Now, the highest court in the country says it will give its opinion. In this election year, people in three more states voted to allow gay marriage, meaning that nine states either already do or soon will allow gay couples to wed. But in 31 other states, it's banned. The Supreme Court has agreed to hear two cases, one about benefits for those already married and one to do with California's Proposition 8, which bans same-sex marriages. I expect four or five justices to uphold Proposition 8. Why? Because the Constitution of the United States doesn't have marriage in it. And the Tenth Amendment says what, the, not in the federal powers, belongs to the states. 
But campaigners reject this conclusion. One rights lawyer told Al Jazeera that it has taken a long time for gay couples to get to this point. We had hoped that the decisions of the lower courts would stand and that couples could begin marrying in California almost immediately. There are so many couples who have been waiting for that day, but clearly we will have to wait just a little bit longer to see what the Supreme Court has to say. This is not the first time the Supreme Court has had to rule on relationships. A judgment in 1967 finally made marriage between black and white couples legal across the country. The president's own parents were not allowed to wed in many southern states. Uh, I think same-sex couples should be able to get married. Barack Obama is the first US leader to support gay marriage. The final decision now rests with the Supreme Court justices. Dominic Kane, Al Jazeera. Frog in a frying pan. There's a story that if you take a frog and you put it in cold water in a frying pan and you put it over the oven and you turn the burner on slowly, as you increase the heat, the frog will stay in the frying pan if you do it slow enough and even enough until the frog fries. America is in a frying pan. The devil has subtly over a period of time desensitized us and taken just like the Greeks went into Israel and taken from our hearts our love for God and replaced it with the customs of man. The minority is re-elected uh, President Obama, but I'm going with Caddy. It, it, was, it was the Tea Party and the thinking of, of the Tea Party and people like that that are driving the Republicans out of contention as a national party. You cannot win nationally if you don't know something about the way the country's changed. Mm -hmm. And the Tea Party seems to think the country can go back 25 or 30 years. Mm -hmm. The greatest slogan that I hated during this class campaign was, we want to take back our country. Guys, it's not your country anymore. It's our country and you're part of it. But that thinking is going to defeat Republicans nationally if they don't get rid of it. Do you hear what Sam Donaldson said? Remember the frog in the frying pan? If you turn up the heat, he'll stay there until he boils. Can you see this happening in our country, folks? Can you see the parallelism that's happening, that, happens, that happened many years ago in Israel is the same thing that's happening today? The story of Hanukkah is a parallel dual meaning. Pay attention. When Antiochus saw his kingdom was established, he determined to become the king of the land of Egypt, that he might reign over both kingdoms. So he invaded Egypt with a strong force, with chariots and elephants and cavalry, and with a large fleet. Number 18, and he engaged Ptolemy, the king of Egypt, in battle. And Ptolemy turned and fled before him, and many were wounded and fell. And they captured the fortified cities in the land of Egypt, and he, Antiochus Epiphany, plundered the land of Egypt. Take a look at the map. Antiochus had the entire area to the north of Israel. Now he invaded Egypt and he captured all of Egypt also. After subduing Egypt, Antiochus went up against Israel and came to Jerusalem with a strong force. And listen to these words. Deceitfully, he spoke peaceful words to the Jews and they believed him. The frog in the frying pan. The devil has gotten in subtly and he's changed American culture. He has destroyed the family and he is destroying lives and he's destroying our government. And we don't even realize it. We're the frogs in the frying pan. Antiochus Epiphany, the son of King Antiochus III, assumed the name Epiphanes. God manifest after he was crowned the king of the Greek Syrian Empire. He called himself God. He saw himself as invincible. First of all, give an honor to God and our Lord and Savior, Barack Obama. Oh, 
a black Muslim in the White House. This is Madonna. Do you see anything here, people? We have been blinded in this country. We trust in man and not in God. This is the symbol, the hand gesture of Satan. Take a look. We have been deceived. The devil has deceived our media and has deceived our people. Remember the frog in the frying pan, folks. This is the all-seeing eye found on the dollar bill, a sign of Satan. Then the king wrote to his whole kingdom that all should be one people and that each should give up his customs. All the Greeks accepted the command of the king. Many from Israel gladly adopted his religion. They sacrificed to idols and profaned the Sabbath. And the king sent letters by messengers to Jerusalem and to the cities of Judah. And he directed them to follow customs strange to the land to forbid burnt offerings and sacrifices and drinking off, drink offerings in the sanctuary, to profane the Sabbath and the feast, to defile the temple and the priest, to build altars and sacrifice uh, and precincts and shrines for idols, to sacrifice swine and unclean animals, and to leave their sons uncircumcised. They were to make themselves abominable by everything unclean and profane, so they should forget the law and change all the ordinances. And whoever does not obey the command of the king shall die. In such words he wrote to his whole kingdom. And he appointed inspectors over the people and commanded the cities of Judah to offer sacrifices city by city. Many of the people, every one who forsook the law, joined them. And they did evil in the land. And they drove Israel into hiding, Israelis into hiding, in every place of refuge that they had. Now, on the 15th day of Kislev, on the 25th day of the month, in 145th year, they erected a desolating sacrilege upon the altar of burnt offering. The books of the law which they found were tore to pieces and burnt with fire. And the book of the covenant, the tar, was found in the possession of anyone, or if anyone adhered to the laws. The decree of the king was, he was condemned to death. According to the decree, they put to death women who had their children circumcised, and their families and those who circumcised them, and they hung the infants from their mother's necks. Many in Israel stood firm and resolved in their heart not to eat the unclean food. They chose to die rather than to be defiled by the food, or profaned by the profaned the Holy Covenant, and they did die. Great was the wrath that came upon Israel. In 168 BC, Antiochus ordered his troops to massacre thousands of Jews in Jerusalem. And at the same time, they defiled the temple by dedicating the temple and setting up a statue of Zeus and sacrificing pigs on the brazen altar and inside the temple. This is the timeline. This is how short it took. From 74 BC, the subtle attempts began to make Israel secular. Remember, folks, the frog in the frying pan. That's where America has been and still is. But things are about to change. Then in 68 BC, Antiochus Epiphany prohibited Jewish worship. 
He destroyed the walls of Jerusalem and damaged the, the sacred scriptures were burnt. He prohibited Sabbath worship, daily sacrifices, kosher observance, circumcision. He desecrated the temple. He sacrificed a pig on the altar. And he placed an altar, uh, an altar of an idol of Zeus on the altar. The Seleucid Greeks under the rule of Antiochus IV were different from all other empires. They didn't just want your land, your resources, and your riches. They wanted your national essence, your cultural identity. They wanted you to think like them, live like them, and even entertain like them. Guys, I want to ask you, do you get up every morning, brush your teeth, go to work, come home at night, eat your meal, go to bed, get up in the morning, brush your teeth, eat your breakfast, go to work, get up and go to bed? Do you go on a few vacations? Are you living the life of a hamster on a wheel? Because most of us are. Most of us are so deceived. It is now time for the Christians in America to wake up. It is now time to rededicate our temples. The problem was that not all Jews were buying into the Hellenistic lifestyle. So the Greeks brought pressure to bear on the defiant Jews. The women who insisted that their sons be sick, circumcised were killed along with their babies. Brides were forced to sleep with Greek officers before they could be with their husbands. The Jews were required to eat pork and sacrifice the pig, sacrifice pigs to the Greek gods. The teaching of the Torah became a capital crime. That hasn't happened in America. But take a look. It's going to. It's coming, folks. It's coming and it's right in front of us. The priests, the sages, and the students went into hiding in order to study and preserve the Torah. The secret weddings were held. Most Jews did anything and everything to remain Jewish. Many were tortured and murdered for their defiance. A period of darkness and suffering descended upon the Jews of Israel. Can you see the darkness descending upon this country, folks? Have you read the news? I'm a teacher. Last Friday... Only five children came to each of my classes because there was a rumor, just like the murders that took place in Connecticut, out of fear. Parents didn't send their children to school. Darkness is now descending upon America. It was during the same time that a Jewish priest named Mattathias rallied the people to revolt. In a small village east of Jerusalem, one of Antioch's officers ordered a wealthy priest named Mattathias to sacrifice a pig to Zeus on a newly erected altar. When Mattathias refused the soldier's orders, another Jewish priest, who had embraced the Greek lifestyle, was ordered to do it. Mattathias was furious. He grabbed the officer's sword, killing him and the corrupt priest. He tore down the altar, cried out, Let everyone who is zealous for the Torah and supports the covenant come with me. 1 Maccabees 2.27 with his five sons and brave men, he led a revolt to end the religious persecution under Antiochus Epiphany. First Maccabees 2, verse 50. On his deathbed, Mattathias said to his five sons, Shimon, John, Judah, Eleazar, and Yachasin, Now, my children, show zeal for the law. Give your life for the covenant. Remember the deeds of our fathers, which they did in their generation, and received great honor and an everlasting name. Verse 52. Was not Abraham found faithful when tested, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness? Verse 53. Joseph, in the time of his distress, kept the commandment and became the Lord of Egypt. 54. Joshua, because he fulfilled the commandment, became the judge in Israel. Caleb, because he testified in the assembly, received an inheritance in the land. David, because he was merciful, inherited the throne of the kingdom forever. Elijah, because of great zeal for the law, was taken up into heaven. <laughs> Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego believed and were saved from the burning fire. And Daniel, because of his innocence, was delivered from the mouth of the lion. After Mattathias died, his son Judah, nicknamed Maccabee, the Hammer, took control of the Jewish revolt to free Israel from the Hellenistic oppression. For three years, 
Judah's fighters hammered away at Antioch's soldiers and the Jewish traders. In 165 BC, 10,000 Maccabees faced 60,000 enemies. God gave them victory in two battles between Jerusalem and Hebron. The enemy retreated and the Maccabees reclaimed Jerusalem. The priests cleansed the temple, burnt, built a new altar and furniture was supplied and hung new curtains before the Holy of Holies. On Kislev 25, the day Israel rededicated the temple, was the same day of the year Antiochus defiled it with a pig three years earlier. They offered a sacrifice on a new stone altar while the Levites played instruments and sang Hallel. Everyone fell face down to worship. Israel decided to celebrate the rededication for eight days because the nation had missed the eight-day celebration of the Feast of Tabernacles. It was the rebirth of a new feast, the Feast of Dedication. Rabbis say that in one day supply of oil miraculously burned for eight days in a lampstand, enough time to press olives and refine new oil. Part 3 the prophecy of Hanukkah revealed. Jesus left the temple and was walking away when his disciples came up to him to call his attention to its building. Master, look! Do you see all these things? Yes, Master. Yes. yes. Truly I tell you, not one stone here will be left on another. Every one will be thrown down. As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately. Tell us, they said, when will this happen and what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? Hmm. Watch out that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name, claiming, I am the Messiah and will deceive many. You will hear of wars and rumors of wars, but see to it that you are not alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of birth pains. Then you will be handed over to be persecuted and put to death. And you will be hated by all nations because of me. At that time, many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other. And many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. But whoever stands firm to the end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then... Will come. Now get this, Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Revelation 11 offers a parallel description from Christ through John of what happens to Jerusalem. Let's read. The Gentiles and the holy city shall they, the Gentiles, tread underfoot forty and two months. It should be obvious this treading by Gentiles must be referring to how long Jerusalem is being trodden down of the Gentiles, as Luke put it. Although the armies around Jerusalem desolate the city, they do not stand in the holy place, as Antiochus' statue did in 168 BC. Remember, this end time event is dual. Two events will occur. One, a blasphemous idol will desolate the temple, or more likely a rebuilt altar. Something must be built in order to have sacrifices. And two, the army desolates the city. Antiochus did both, setting up an idol in Zerubbabel's temple and sacrificing a pig on the altar and then desolating the city. He therefore becomes an important type for both. Antiochus Epiphanes was a forerunning type of the false prophet, but also of the beast. Also understand that the ultimate fulfillment of the abomination is not only a statue being set up, it is the final leader of the religious system, 
the human personification of the Babylonish whore who enters Jerusalem saying, I am God. When the false prophet directs the beast to erect a statue at the site of the reconstituted daily sacrifices, the abomination will officially stand in the holy place. Jerusalem's desolation will then come from the armies that surround it. Part 4. Living a rededicated life every day. The message of Hanukkah is that we now possess the temple inside. When you make Jesus and you repent of your sins and you stand before God and you say, I am born again, I will live for Jesus, I am a Christian, I represent Jesus on this earth, and you rededicate your life, the Holy Spirit comes inside and lives inside of you, and you are now the temple of God. 1 Corinthians 6, 19-20 do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? For you were brought by a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Romans 12, 1 and 2. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is good and acceptable and the perfect will of God. Leviticus 11.44 I am the Lord your God. Consecrate yourself and be holy, because I am holy. 1 Peter 1.16 You must be holy, as I am holy. John 14, verse 15, 21 and 23, and John 15, 10. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. Christians, the saying, once born again, always, once saved, always, lie from the devil. Every day, the devil deceives you. He's there trying to pull you away. And if you sin, this is what you do. You go to the cross. You repent of your sins daily and allow the blood of Jesus to wash away those sins. And you are righteous so that you can walk along the path that God has chosen you to walk. It says the steps of a righteous man are directed by God. If you sin, you are no longer righteous in God's eyes. And it says give and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. <laughs> will it be put into your bosom? For with the same measure that you use, it will be measured back to you. We're not talking about money. Your life. When you wake up in the morning, look up and to the ceiling and say, Lord, thank you for another day. Turn on your spiritual switch. Thank you, Lord. I am here to serve you. This is what Christians are to do. Not give Jesus a teaspoon of ourselves on, on a Sunday or say a little measly mouth prayer. We are living sacrifices. We are to live our lives before God pure and holy and repent when we sin. Take a look at this picture. We have a Bible study and our Bible teacher, Jim Andres, made this picture. This is how a Christian should live. There's the Christian at the bottom. There are all the gifts that are promised in the Bible at the top. Prophecy, eternal life, power, speaking to healing, blessing, wisdom, heaven. And this flow should be going between us and God all the time. But this is what happens, folks. The, <laughs> the devil, and the devil is real. Preachers don't preach it. They're afraid of him because they, he has them deceived. But it tells you in Ephesians chapter 6 that we are being fired at all the time. And here's what separates us from God and our relationship from God. Unbelief, unforgiveness, sin, not keeping the Ten Commandments. Folks, this is what a lie from devil has gotten into the church. We are sinners and Jesus died on the cross. His blood makes us righteous. Every day, go before God and cleanse yourself. Rededicate your temple. This is what God, this is the meaning of Hanukkah. Rededicate ourselves every day so we can walk along that path that He has chosen us to walk. Take a look at the picture. 
This is Psalm 91. Those of you that repent daily and cover yourself with the blood of Jesus, now you are righteous to walk along the path that he has chosen you to walk. Now you are covered by the blessings of God. You are outside the curses. No matter what the devil does, he can't touch you. You shall not fear. You shall have shalom. Churches were filled in Newtown, Connecticut last night as candlelight vigils were held to grieve for the 27 innocent people killed and the countless lives of those shattered by a few seconds of crazed carnage. On Friday, Neil Cavuto asked me, where was God? And I said that for 50 years, we've systematically attempted to have God removed from our schools, our public activities, but then at the moment we have a calamity, we wonder where he was. Well, the predictable left lit up the airwaves and blogosphere with a vile and vicious reaction and jumped to the conclusion that I said that if we had prayer in school, the shooting wouldn't have happened. Well, I said nothing of the sort. It's far more than just taking prayer or Bible reading out of the schools. It's the fact that people sue a city so we aren't confronted with a manger scene or a Christmas carol, that lawsuits are filed to remove a cross that's a memorial to fallen soldiers. Churches and Christian-owned businesses are told to surrender their values under the edict of government orders to provide tax-funded abortion pills. We carefully and intentionally stop saying things are sinful, and we call them disorders. Sometimes we even say they're normal. And to get to where that we have to abandon bedrock moral truths, then we are asked, well, where was God? And I respond that as I see it, We've escorted him right out of our culture and we've marched him off the public square. And then we express our surprise that a culture without him actually reflects what it's become. As soon as the tragedy unfolded, I think God did show up. He showed up in the lives of teachers who put their lives between a gunman and their students. He showed up in policemen who rushed into the school not knowing if they would be met with a barrage of bullets. He showed up in the forum of hugs and tears for children, parents, and teachers who had lived through the slaughter. He showed up at the overflow church services where people lit candles and prayed. And he showed up at the White House where the president invoked his name and quoted from his book. And in a few days or weeks, we'll probably ask God to excuse himself from view and we will announce in our arrogant pride that we're now enlightened and educated and we've evolved beyond needing him. And somebody's going to suggest that we pass a law to stop all this kind of thing. I might want to point out that we don't have to pass a new law. There's one that's been around a while that works if we teach it and observe it. Thou shalt not kill. Oh, there are about nine others. But to tell you about them would require bringing God back. And we know how unacceptable that might be. Let the light of Yeshua, Jesus, glow through you every moment of every single day.